a man with no remorse. I hit him in the head seven or eight times with a ball peen hammer until I thought he was dead, and uh, I just left. Has a change of heart. Who, out of anyone, had the ability to change, radically change, severely messed up people. Find out why on today's 700 Club Interactive. On 700 Club Interactive, we use technology to pray for each other and explore topics that matter to you. Watch what God is doing in the world today. Well, welcome to the show. The late, great college basketball coach, Jimmy Valvano, once said that everyone should do three things every day. Think, laugh, and cry. Unfortunately, David Wood couldn't do any of those things. He was diagnosed with an anti-personality disorder, so he lived without thinking, laughing, or crying until the day he learned how to love. If my child died, I would want to cry my eyes out. Um, I don't think I would. Sociopaths don't form normal emotional attachments to other people. They lack empathy. When they see a person suffering, they don't feel bad over it. I was in high school biology when evolutionary theory was really laid out for us. Species develop new characteristics, new traits, and then those can actually eventually take over. And so I concluded that maybe I had reached a higher stage of humanity where I wasn't held back by emotions the way other people were. And so I came to regard all these little rules that people tell you to follow as kind of brainwashing me. Breaking into places and you know breaking into the school or stealing things. I felt like I was stripping away these layers of rules that people had been imposing on me my entire life. And it was, a, it was an amazing feeling. And if I really wanted to, to sort of be free of everything I'd been, I'd been brainwashed into thinking about right and wrong, and I decided uh, to kill my dad. And I decided to do it in a brutal fashion, not a, not a gunshot or anything. I was going to do it with a hammer. When I walked up to my dad, I've got a, I had a hammer in my hand, and I hit him in the head seven or eight times with a ball peen hammer until I thought he was dead, and uh, I just left. One of his friends, Jim, found him, covered in blood, took him to a hospital, and so I went and told my mom, hey, I may have done this because I, I think I'm being told on at that moment. I mean, instead of taking me to uh, the police or anything, she took me to a psychiatric hospital. They made a report based on the, the time that I was there, and it said antisocial personality disorder. Eventually, Virginia had them remove me from the psychiatric hospital and take me to jail. Since my dad survived, I was convicted of malicious wounding. I was sentenced to 10 years in prison. There was a Christian named Randy, and he was a bit different from everyone else. And one day he was reading his Bible and I walked up to him and I said, hey, you know why you're reading your Bible? You're reading your Bible because you're born in the United States. If you've been born in China, you'd be a Buddhist. If you've been born in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you've been born in Saudi Arabia, you'd be a Muslim because people like you believe whatever you're taught to believe. He started arguing with me and started tearing me to pieces. And that was very different from other Christians that I'd argued with in the past, I ended up in, uh, for a couple of months, a series of arguments with Randy about Christianity versus my worldview. Randy was winning the arguments that we would get into. I'm not going to beat him this way. I'm going to have to really learn the Bible so that I can respond to him. I regarded that as my weakness. I have to say I was impressed with Jesus. I went from thinking that I'm the best person in the world to thinking that I'm the worst person in the world. The question came up, either I'm stuck like this, or there's someone out there who can deal with this. Who, out of anyone, had the ability to change, radically change, severely messed up people? It's Jesus or it's nothing. 
it's Jesus or there is just no hope. I bowed down and I prayed and I said, God, I don't know if I'm going to believe in you tomorrow, but I believe in you right now. If you can do anything with me, you're welcome to it. And I ran through the sort of sinner's prayer that I'd heard um, there in the jail. When I sat up, uh, the whole world looked different. It looked like I was in a different place, like everything was a different color. And I didn't know if this was, you know, just something weird going on, but it was, uh, I didn't want to hurt anyone at that point. And uh, some, uh, an amazing calm. I felt like I'd been physically nonstop brawling all my life. And then I finally could just sit down and rest. While I was in prison, I thought it would be bad to actually confess because my dad, again, had no recollection. I'm a Christian now. I can't spend my entire life saying I haven't done something that I've done. I'm going to write a letter to my dad right now and uh, lay everything out to him. He came to see me at the, at the, at the first chance and um, he said, it's okay. And uh, he forgives me. And, and he told me, he said, he said, I really didn't think you did it. And so for him to hear all of that at once and then to forgive me, it's a, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing stuff. Between jail and prison, I was locked up for a little over five years. I got out of uh, prison in 2000 and started college immediately. Started arguing with a young woman who was an agnostic and she eventually became a Christian and we were married the following year. We have kids and, you know, getting to watch them grow up and Given the things I've done, I should not be able to have this sort of this sort of normal life. It, uh, it it kind of blows me away. I want people out there to know that there is a creator to this world, that there is a, a point to this world, that other people um, are important, that it's not just all about you. Jesus rose from the dead, and that shows that there is a point to everything, that there is a creator, that he does care about us and that he entered this world to die for us. And that is a message that matters because it changes everything. The message that matters because it changes everything. And that's the whole point of the Gospel of John and the opening, you know, the word, the logos. Another way to translate that is the message. The message was with God. The message was God, and the message came here and took on flesh and dwelt among us so that we could behold him. We could, we could see what God was, was like. Jesus came to reveal the Father. He came to reveal the wonderful message that God is love. He so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's you, whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life to change what happened, how the world was broken by what we did in the Garden of Eden. Broken. All creation came under a curse we, we had the knowledge now of good and evil, and with that knowledge continually chose to do what was wrong. And some of us, our conscience got seared along the way. We didn't even recognize we were doing wrong anymore. It just seemed to not bother us. But Jesus came, and he came to change all that. And he came to change you and to give you life and life everlasting, to remake you. I love David's prayer. If you can do anything with me, then take me. Here I am. If you can do anything with me. David had given up on himself. He had come to that kind of a bottom where he didn't see any hope, didn't see any chance. But he said to God, God, I believe in you right now. And if, 
there is anything you can do with me, then do it. Take me. And you heard what he said. Suddenly a calm came over him. He was able to sit down and rest. And all that burden, all that guilt, all of that was taken away. He was able to sit down and rest. And that's what Jesus promises, that you're able to enter into his rest. The rest that is a peace that passes all understanding, where you understand he has your future. You understand that your past has been forgiven. You've been given, been given newness of life. Behold, all things are made new. And you can walk in that. You can walk in that light with the confidence that you'll be with him for all eternity. It's a wonderful thing. It's wonderful news. It's the best news the world has ever heard. Now, here it is for you. If you want this, it's real easy. All you have to do is pray the same way David prayed. If there's anything you can do with my life, here it is. And just surrender to say, Lord, not my will anymore, but let your will be done. If you can change me, if you can make me new, then here I am. And all you have to do is pray that and ask for it. And he'll come through. He'll come through for you. Now, some of you say, well, I prayed that. And then somewhere along the way, I, I decided to do something. And, and I decided to take a wrong turn. Well, there's hope for you, too. That if you're, if you're able to say, Jesus, forgive me. Could you cleanse me? Could you make me new again? He'll do that. The Bible promises that if we confess our sins, he will be faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's that simple. It's that same jailhouse prayer that David learned. Here I am. If you can do anything with me, take me. If you want help with this prayer, if you want to make this decision today, all you have to do is call us, 888-777-1999. When you call, just say to the person who picks up that phone, I want, to, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to become a Christian today. When you call, I've got something free for you. It's a CD teaching of what's the, what do Christians believe? What are the pillars of the faith? How do you live the Christian life? What is all of this about? How do you start? I also encourage you to get a copy of the Bible. If you don't have one, we have one free for you online. All you have to do is log on to CBN.com. And there's a place there in the spiritual life section where you can have, have a Bible. We'll take you through the Bible in a year. You can have, be part of a Bible reading program where you read it every single day. It's through reading the Word that you renew your mind. I also encourage you to join our local church. It's in the fellowship of believers that we grow in Christ. But it all starts with that prayer and that decision. So make that phone call right now, 888-777-1999. Well, still ahead, we'll pray for you, plus a woman who lost her husband to drugs, and then she turned her life over to alcohol. I was left to raise our son by myself. And the only way I could deal with it was to drink because it would really numb the pain. How this hardcore drinker found her way up next. I just had hit a point that I couldn't take it anymore. Can't you get it through your head? I just don't love you. God, if you are really real, make yourself real to me. Change my life and put the pieces back together. And if he did it for me, he can do it for anybody. Nothing is impossible with God. I was so determined not to be like my mom. I was so determined to be completely different. And I, and I said I was never gonna let a man beat me. I was never going to do drugs like my mom or anybody. I, I was going to be a good girl, but I didn't know how to be. I was just a mess. 
exactly like my mother and, and worse. The Lord dealt with me when I was in jail, talked to me about surrendering your life and about making Him the Lord of your life and completely turning over everything to Him. There was a night where God spoke to me. He said, you need to forgive your mother. And when He did that, I, and I forgave her, a flood of tears just came over my eyes and I had cried like I had never cried in my, in my whole life. Today, I know that God is real because He saved me as I was dying. And I, I, no one can convince me otherwise. Sharon is a single mom who started every morning with one thing in mind. She wanted a drink. Most nights, she ended the day drunk. Sharon went on like this for years until something she saw on TV made her stone cold sober. Sharon Pate Bell worked for 20 years as a merchant marine in New Orleans. She had the mouth to prove it. Cursing was my best friend and I had a lot of friends who cursed. That was the language we used. And uh, I learned how to intimidate people by my mouth. In 1998, her heroin-addicted husband was found shot to death in the New Orleans housing projects. I just got a phone call one day that um, he had been killed. I, I just felt my whole world come down. I was just really devastated and um, I was left to raise our son by myself. And the only way I could deal with it was to drink because it would really numb the pain. Her drinking went on for years. Sharon became a full-fledged alcoholic. I went to the club right on in the worst part of town and just drank every day till I would just be drunk. I'd wake up in the morning, uh, even sometimes without eating. And that would be the first thing I would want was a drink. My body just would need a drink. I didn't want to be that way, but I just didn't know how to change. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. Sharon and her young son relocated to Baton Rouge, where she rented a small house. I had a chance to sober up, and I would just come here and pray and hope that God would just helped me because remember now I lost everything I had. I had nothing. She started reading a Bible and watching the 700 Club every day on TV. And this one particular day, there was a story about this man who had a drinking problem and how God had healed him. All I remember was my hands were up. I was asking God to touch me and to heal me. And I felt the presence of God come in the room. And I knew then that it was over. I felt the freedom. Before I was not drinking because I was scared. But I felt God when he entered my heart. And the desire just left. Sharon gave her life to Jesus and was instantly set free from her addiction to alcohol. She didn't even realize it until a few weeks later. Somebody offered me a drink, and before I knew it, I said, oh, I don't drink. And then when I said it, it came out so quickly, I was like, yeah, that's right, I, I, don't, I don't drink, and I don't want to drink. And I never think about drinking. I could walk down the store, down the aisle, and see liquor, and it doesn't even cross my mind. It's like it never happened. Complete, total healing. Sharon went back to college and recently graduated with honors. Her son just graduated from high school, also with honors. Her life is brand new, and so is her mouth. My mouth is to bless. My mouth is to praise. My mouth is used for worship. I thank God for healing me. I thank God for delivering me. Thank God for cleaning up my life. And most of all, just giving me back my mind. And he said, if I keep my mind on him, he'll keep me in perfect peace. And that the peace that I have today is not the kind of peace that the world has. This is a peace in the midst of the storm. I still can trust God. 
I still can believe God. And today, he's turned my whole life around. Sharon encourages people who are addicted, like she was, to put their trust in God. It doesn't matter if your husband's a junkie. It doesn't matter if you, you're an alcoholic. It doesn't matter if you're even struggling with drugs. God can deliver you in the midst of it. He can touch your heart. He can change your taste buds. Once you can get into the presence of God, it does things that nobody else can do for you. You can have a different life. You can have a different life. Realize it's good news. You can have a different life. It doesn't matter if you're a drug addict, if you're an alcoholic, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to him. He's able to take all of that. He's able to change you right down to your taste buds. Well, we are 700 Club Interactive and we want to pray for you. So let's go over to Jessica to see what's happening online. Well, Gordon, Colleen posts, my husband was addicted to drugs and alcohol before he became a Christian. After four years of sobriety, he has started using again. He says he misses being home and he loves me, but I am a recovering addict myself, so I can't let him be in our home while he is using. Please pray for us. We have five children and we need deliverance and healing in our family. Teresa asks, please pray for me and my husband. It has been a long time since I've smiled or felt peace in my life. I need help to overcome an addiction and get rid of my depression. I also need a job because my husband can't work due to his health. Please pray that God will provide all these things and heal my husband. Well, if you're watching and you can relate to those prayer requests, join in with us. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your son to set the captives free. And for Colleen and for Teresa and for their families, Father, we ask that you come and bring healing and deliverance. Father, we pray that you go to the root of the pain problem and you heal their hearts, that you heal their minds, that you heal their bodies, that you would completely remove the desire for drugs, for alcohol, like we saw in the last piece, that you would change their taste buds. Father, that you would bring healing and hope to this family, that they would reach out to you and say, Jesus, even though I can't, I know that you can. So, Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Gordon. Well, if you have a prayer request or a praise report, let us know. All you have to do is go to facebook.com slash 700 Club Interactive, or you can also write to us on Twitter at 7C Interactive, or you can call us, numbers toll free, 888-777-1999. Coming up, a young boy who was abandoned. There were many times I didn't have any food to eat. Hear how he got food and a family, Plus, we'll be answering your questions. All that's up next. Elected the first Indian American governor, he made history in 2008. As the son of immigrants, is this debate over immigration reform personal to you? This to me is such a simple issue. What does the future hold? You have changed your mind on Common Core Standards for Louisiana. What changed for you? Governor of Louisiana, Bobby Jindal. Not only do we oppose what the other side is doing, we've got better ideas. On the 700 Club, Monday. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's word to the children you love. 
Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. Our finances were dwindling and we knew that something was really wrong with our business. Our client base was down. We had a lot of debt when we continued to make our offerings. Sowing seeds that the Lord was going to use for His purpose and His glory, and He was going to reward it, and He did. Little by little, things just started getting better. More peace in our house, more love in our house. Give to the Lord what is His first. He'll give everything else to you, and above and beyond, He'll provide for you. Chandan is a young boy with no home, no parents. If he wanted food, he had to find it for himself. And he wasn't always successful. Climbing trees to get fruit was often the only way Chandon could feed himself. My father died because he drank too much. After he died, my mother ran away. Chandon tried his best to make some money by selling firewood, but he only made about one dollar a week. It was not easy to get food for less than 20 cents each day. There were many times I didn't have any food to eat. Then a pastor bought Chandon a boat ticket so he could go to a children's home on the other side of the river. It was sponsored by CBN's Orphan's Promise. Once there, he was fed nutritious meals and given new clothes. As soon as I got there, I had new parents and I made a lot of friends right away. He was excited when he found out he'd be able to go to school. But what he learned at the children's home changed his outlook on life. I heard that Jesus died on the cross for us. He did that so we could live with him for eternity. I want to serve Jesus and tell many other people about him. You can be part of changing lives around the world. We're a lot more than just a TV show. We want to help people. We want to help people in need, and we also want to preach the gospel to them to bring them that good news that God is not mad at them. What he wants is for him, them to be with him for all eternity. If you want to be a part of all of that, all you have to do is join the 700 Club. How much is it? $20 a month, 65 cents a day, and you join with tens of thousands of people that want to make a difference in the world. So if that's you, if that's what you want to do, give us a call, 888-777-1999. Well, we still have time for viewer questions, so let's go back to Jessica. Well, Gordon, Jennifer writes, My son is six years old. His father has been in prison since his birth. He is being released soon, but he seems to be the same lost, angry drug addict that he's always been. I'm afraid to let him see my son and be a bad influence in his life. The Bible says to forgive and show love to one another. So am I wrong to keep my son away from him? Gordon? Um, Jennifer, I don't think you would be wrong in that. It's, it, I wouldn't look at it from a standpoint of sin or not sin. You know, I would look at it, what is best for the child? And if it's best for the child uh, that the child not be exposed to that behavior, um, then yay, uh, let, let's recognize that you've got to raise uh, this son. And it's, it's difficult. Being a single parent in today's world is difficult enough. Do you need these other things added to it? Uh, do you need to see the behavior disorder, and addiction is a behavior disorder, in the father? Uh, and I would say no. Same time, uh, walk in forgiveness. Uh, and I really believe in that. I really believe in you saying, I set him free. He owes nothing to me. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be resentful of the behavior. Uh, I'm not going to be somehow trapped in, in that whirlwind of addiction. I don't, I don't have to have that in my life. But at the same time, I forgive him. And I set him free. When you, you'll find that when you do that uh, and you don't have any hurt and resentment, and that may come, uh, you may have feelings all, on, all along the lines of, why isn't he helping? Why isn't he here? 
all those other things uh, that come when you're a single parent. So forgive him, set him free, but you don't have to expose your son to it. We leave you this word from Luke, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. God bless you.